Hello and, and welcome to this Grain Storage webinar on, uh, on storage upgrades. My name is Chris Warwick. I'm a consultant based in Horsham, Victoria, uh, and I manage the GRDC's Grain Storage Extension Project. My role uh, has developed over the past 10 years and since the very sad loss of Peter Botter last year, uh, I now service the GRDC Southern Region with Grain Storage Workshops information. Um, I'd like to thank the BCG for facilitating this session for us. Um, if you're ha having any trouble hearing me uh, or can't see the PowerPoint presentation, please type in a question window as I mentioned. Um, but yeah, thanks to the BCG for, for organising the webinar for us today. Storage upgrades. To me, it's the, the aim, the ultimate aim is to, to make best management possible uh, and safer and easier. That's, that's the underlying message that I'd like to be able to pass along to you guys today. I'm just going to grab the whole other overview for just a moment. First thing in, uh, in, in, in storage upgrades is actually about hygiene from, from my perspective. Um, and that obviously starts with, with suing the queen for, for, for a start, but thinking about how you could make storage easier to clean, getting rid of those spots uh, inside silos or storages that collect rain, see if you can figure out ways to, to stop that collecting to make them even easier to clean. Um, secondly, obviously with hygiene, we, we look at structural treatments, um, something like a diet to make a surf, a dry side product, um, are good for structural treatments. There's things we can do to try and make that process easier as well. So if something's easy, we're more likely to do it. So having a little uh, um, diatomaceous earth set up that you can easily um, use to distribute the dry side through the silo makes the job quick and easy. Um, that way when our storages are empty, it doesn't take long to, to whip over there and put a bit of dry side in um, and, and we keep the, the storage clean so that when we do fill it with grain, it's, uh, it's clean to start with. Maintenance. We often forget about maintenance for, for grain storage. We think about maintenance in terms of our other machinery on the farm. Um, but when it comes to grain storage, we often forget that it does need maintenance as well, like most things on the farm. Um, so that, that's about checking the seals. Um, if, the, if the silo is gas tight, Sealable, we, we of course want to check the seals that we know they're going to perish over time, um, get damaged through use. Um, on the big flat bottom side with a concrete base, um, there's a lot of pressure on the seal around the base between the, the wall and the concrete. That's a common spot we see seals breaking down. So doing the maintenance to reseal those spots is, is really quite important. Um, fixing damages around the silo, often the auger hits the top of the silo and, and dims the lid or something like that. Little make bits and pieces there, any rust or, or repairs we can, we can also fix up. Even if a silo is not gas tight sealable, having a look at you know, is there any spots that water leaks in or condensation forms, are there ways that we can improve the structure of the silo to make it work better for us? Of course, if we do have gas tight sealable storage, ideally we'd be doing a pressure test every year so that when we come to do a fumigation, if we need to, we know that that silo will meet a half-life pressure test. Um, it's a lot easier to fix any issues, any seals um, in the off-season, while we've got a bit of time, and while the storage is empty, and we can actually access those hatches and replace seals or refine leaks. So I encourage you to, to do a pressure test um, before harvest and, and give you a chance to fix any issues that need fixing. But part of that pressure test also is to check the oil levels in the oil relief valves. Check that they're, they're, um, they're at the mark, and if you've got um, some silos with these older oil relief valves didn't last too long in the sun, may even need replacing. Um, if you're looking at replacing oil relief valves, have a look at replacing them with a bit larger one. Um, there is there is sometimes issues with these small oil relief valves that they don't let enough air through. Um, when the ambient conditions change from hot to cold or cold to hot, it's really a lot of air that has to go through those oil relief valves. So if even consider upgrading those oil relief valves to, to something a bit bigger. 
often get asked about retro sealing. Can we retro seal um, existing silos so that so that we can use fumigation in them? What we find is the cost to do it is actually quite high, um, and the success rate of them of retro sealing is is quite low. Um, if we're going to consider uh, retro sealing, it's most commonly done by a, an external contractor. What we need to insist is that when the job is complete, that that silo will meet a three minute half life pressure test. What that means is that it demonstrates the silo has actually been sealed um, to gas tight standards enough that will hold phosphine for the required time uh, to kill insects that are otherwise taken. So if the contractor um, that you're looking at for doing retro sealing says, I'm not going to pull a pressure test, I, I'm not going to put a relief valve on it or, or guarantee that it will meet a half-life pressure test, then it, it's, really, it's really not worth um, trying to seal it. I, I, I really encourage you to save your money and put it towards buying some gas type storage down the track. Um, it, it often actually requires that the picture I've got here um, to make this silo gas tight sealable, you'd actually have to replace that bottom outlet to, to make it seal. So it is quite a lot of work. It's more than just adding, um, adding sealant everywhere and, and, and spraying a sealant product all around the silo. It's actually about designing the silo structurally to be able to seal. Um, so that's why we, we often encourage, um, rather than retro sealing, um, consider just adding when you're adding to your storage next, make sure you add gas type seals to storage. Some options you can look at to improve, and we'll go through those today, um, to improve those, those unsealable storages, those old, older silos, um, you can do things like adding aeration cooling to them, it's not expensive, uh, and consider using protectants where they're appropriate as well. So you make those older storages still quite usable, functional, um, and, and have some preventative measures in there so that you hopefully don't have to use phosphine so we don't need it suitable. Aeration cooling I just mentioned. Um, in terms of silo upgrades, I think this is probably the most common one that we look at um, and, and can add a lot of benefits. So aeration cooling, obviously we're looking at cooling the grain down for quality characteristics, um, but also to slow down the insect for reproduction livestock and even slow it to a point where that insects stop reproducing, stop breeding. So that's what we're trying to do with aeration cooling. And that can be retrofitted added to silos. And that doesn't matter whether the silo is a, an older one that's, that's not sealable or a newer one that is, is potentially sealable. Aeration cooling can be added to, to, um, to both. Um, the cost is not prohibitive. We're, we're, for aeration cooling, we're looking at low airflow rates, so they're small um, single phase fans for a cone bottom silo. Um, obviously we want to look at uh, some ducting. I don't mind this style of ducting with the round tube. Um, it's reasonably easy to retrofit uh, and it can be easily removed for, for cleaning for good hygiene. So I don't mind that design at all. Make sure you consider um, when you do get this ducting, whether you need um, ducting that's suitable for canola or just for cereal grains. So they have different size holes in it. Um, I much prefer to see the retrofitting aeration cooling. We find having one or two smaller fans per silo is a lot more effective than, and efficient than having one large fan plumbed into multiple silos. We've seen those systems. What we tend to see is um, you either can only run the fan on one silo at a time, um, which means when we get good aeration cooling conditions, we can only capture that for one silo at a time when we want to get the good aeration cooling conditions for all the silos at the same time. Um, the other issue we see is if you're trying to put air from one fan through even two silos at the same time with a bit of plumbing, the air will take the path of least resistance. So that means the silo that needs the most amount of air is actually going to get the least amount of air, which is the best in So prefer to, um, to spend the money to get one small fan or even two small fans um, per silo is, is, a, is a much more effective way to go. We're looking at aeration cooling. Obviously, we 
pumping air into the silo, we need a spot for the air to get out. That can be as simple as just um, propping the lid open, figuring out a way that you can, can prop the lid open a little bit to let some air out. Um, this hat on the bottom right, you can see the screen, it's a little trollman's hat um, designed to sit on, on top of the silo while it's under aeration cooling, so majority of the year. And that's got a gap in there to let the air out uh, and a bit of mesh to stop the edge of or anything in there. And you can see the original lid just sits to the side here for when we need to seal it down for fumigation. Another option is a, um, a dedicated vent, like the one here. Um, it, it is another way to, uh, to be able to leave the solo open and venting, um, but keep the rain out while we're, we're under aeration. Something else to add for the you know, aeration line, some, we may already have aeration cooling. We could perhaps just do some more learning about when to run the fan, what, what we're actually trying to achieve, what the conditions are that we're aiming for. Um, and if we don't already, we can look at adding an aeration controller um, to automate that process, make it more efficient for us. So it's aeration cool. Grand opening lids, most silos have grand opening lids these days. There's a few older ones that, that haven't. Um, they're a good safety feature, time saving feature that we can add. Um, something like this one down the bottom, very um, simple and easy, um, cheap to add. Be aware with those, those ones that they're, they're not um, really designed for a sealable stylo. Um, if you want to seal that lid down, you'd still have to climb to the top and, and lock it down. The one on the right here um, could potentially be added to it to a gas type sealable silo. And the reason being that it's got a way to put some down pressure on that lid. It's not relying on just a spring. Um, you can actually put some down pressure on that lid to really hold the seal down tight for fumigation if you need to. So be aware of the difference there if you're adding down. Ladders and walkways. Um, some silos we see out there have actually been purchased without ladders um, for safety reasons and, and cost reasons. Um, to, to actually know what's going on in the soil and monitor our grain, make sure we don't have insects or, or mold or issues going on, we do need to get to the top to, to be able to inspect the grain. So of course we, we need a ladder to do that safely. So have a think about, can we make access to the top possible for a start, but then safer and easier. Can we add a safe ladder? Can we improve the ladder that's already there by putting a platform or a cage around it or even um, replacing that ladder? Can we put handrails on the top of the silo where, we, where we've got to access the lid to make that safer? Um, or is actually doing a walkway system a better way to go? Um, a lot of times if you're getting up to check one silo, you're going to be getting up to check them all. So having one ladder and a walkway across the top um, is not only safer, but a much quicker quicker and easier way to be able to check all your silos when you're doing your monitoring. Um, of course, um, safety harnesses are, are, are another addition um, at every time that we're working from heights. Uh, safety additions. Not going to overlook safety, but it's something we, we do really need to consider, um, particularly for storage. That there are a lot of hazards inherently. Um, to me, safety is about um, the same as anything on the phone. We've got to identify what are potential risks, what are the potential hazards, and then look at what's the likelihood of those things happening. What would the severity be if they did happen, and how can we reduce either the likelihood or the severity? So that simple process for, um, for workplace health and safety is the same for grain storage as other parts of our farm. So we can go through that process. Um, the common things that we see in grain storage that can be improved from a safety perspective are things like adding some signage. If there's overhead power lines nearby, um, trucks tipping up and augers and those sorts of things can get quite high and quite close to power lines. So putting warning signs for those is, is a really good one. Um, Having signs available for the, when, we, when we are treating grain, when we are using phosphine or, or an umber fumigant, having some signs and, and orange bunting to warn people that might be coming to the silo. Visitors or even trucks coming to, um, to outload and, and accidentally got the wrong silo, the last thing you want is them to be outloading the silo that's under fumigation. So having a warning sign for taking away is really important. The obvious ones, guards, trip hazards, 
things you're going to bump your head on, um, those common things can be improved. It just takes a bit of time and, and, and a little bit of um, diligence to fix those up. And again, do it before harvest, before you're busy and, and when you've got a bit of time to do that. Um, considering how, how accessible solos are for children, obviously they're not a safe place for children to play, so making sure that is um, are blocked off that, that children can't climb them. Um, harnesses and, and personal protective equipment, um, like this monitor here, and, and, and like we've got the, the example we're using harness and, and, uh, and a mask for phosphine and gloves. A few personal protective equipment, a bit like uh, if you think about back to when you first learnt to drive a car on the road. Think about that day, you hopped in the car, probably with a parent or, or an adult friend. Um, you sat down, it's all a bit unfamiliar, you had to adjust the seat, uh, adjust the mirrors, the side mirrors, centre mirror. Think about the handbrake and you put brake on and then check your surrounds and then back out carefully. It's all a bit unfamiliar, it's a lot to concentrate on. Personal protective equipment's a bit the same. First time we use it, the first time we put, we're a bit unfamiliar with it. It takes a bit of time to put that harness on and feels a bit clumsy and awkward. But the same as driving a car, the more you do it, you know, you'll, you'll hop into it and you don't have to adjust it anymore. You don't have to readjust the mirrors because they're, they're the same as what they were last time you drove the car. And before you know it, if you go and hop in the car now, you put the seatbelt on, you take the handbrake off and you're out of the out of the driveway before you know it, you've hardly even thought about it because it's, it's familiar to you, it's second nature. Same as personal protective equipment. You become familiar with it, um, it's not such a big deal and it, it's actually just part of everyday life. So I encourage you to use it, to make it easy to use and, and just get familiar with it. We'll get the key points there. Other things around safety, um, obviously augers pose a risk, having guards on those. Um, belts and conveyors as well and even just making them easier to move around the storage so having good gravel um, level gravel um, so that organs are not swaying around when they're tipped up and, and being moved and making those organ movements safer ground driven organs obviously help as well lights um, not only convenient but add, add safety to our grain storage if we're looking at using storage at night yeah, adding a bit of light and make, make the job easier, make the job safer. Monitoring equipment, I said it was about storage upgrades. Um, monitoring, monitoring equipment, I'm going to put in the same topic as well. If you think about the dollars worth of grain that we're actually storing, maybe for a, a smaller operator, we're storing 500 tonne, $300 a tonne, we've got $150,000 worth of grain sitting there. To me, that justifies a small investment in some monitoring equipment. Um, and that's something we can purchase before harvest, get ourselves ready to do. So something like a probe trap, we can put in the top of the silo. There's one here you can see poked in the top of the grain. If there's any insects in there, there are a really quick and easy way to be able to check if the insect numbers are increasing or decreasing or if you've got insects in there. So you put the probe trap in, once a month we come along and pull it out and check it. Same with the temperature here. We can, we can buy a cheap um, temperature probe that stays in the silo or we can buy a nice big long probe here that we can spear into the grain and check the temperature. If we are going to leave something in the silo, make sure you tie it off there um, in case someone does unload the silo and forget it's there. You don't want that going at the auger. A sieve, an insect sieve with a two mil um, woven mesh is a good way to, to sieve for insects. It makes that job quick and easy as well. Um, obviously a moisture meter um, helps us check if there's anything going in with moisture in the grain as well. Um, and then having a way to record what we find. So if we do find insects, if we do find moisture changing or temperature changing in, in the direction we wouldn't expect, having a way to write that down and record what we're doing. If we do a treatment to our grain storage, if, if we put a, you know, a protectant on it or if we Got a fumigate, having a record of that. So whether we use the stored grain um, app with monitoring capability or we've got our own spreadsheet or a notepad system, I think we'll either record what we're monitoring in grain storage, but I think it's a good idea. To finish off, the, the key points I'd really like you to take home, 
So to me, it's about making best practice management possible, safer, and easier. That's really what we're trying to do. It doesn't have to be over complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. It's just about taking a step back when we're not under pressure and having a look at how we can, how we can improve. Um, simple maintenance and improvements that really can make a big difference. Not only to making life easier, but making the, the, the chance of us being able to store grain successfully and trouble free um, much higher. And, and again, keep safety front of mind. Um, doing the prioritising upgrades, have a look at what those risks might be, the likelihood of them happening, and, and the severity of those risks. That's, that's the core content that I'd like to go through today. I can see some questions coming in, so I'd encourage you to, to, um, to continue those questions coming in, and, and we can have a discussion around answering those. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, just let you know that the next um, the next webinar will be on the 8th of October at 10 a.m. We're going to look at grain bags and bunkers. Um, the other thing to keep an eye out for um, after this uh, webinar will be a short 30-second uh, survey get emailed through to you to give, it, give us some feedback so we can hopefully keep improving what we do for you guys. Um, got a question here. What, what are the ideal conditions for aeration and cooling? Great question. Um, can I clarify there, Jack, are we talking about what are we aiming for with cooling or what are the conditions that we want to pick, um, what ambient conditions are we trying to pick to, to get our best cooling? I just wonder if I can clarify the question. Ambient conditions, thank you. So picking the best ambient conditions for cooling, um, it's a combination of temperature and relative humidity. And that's what the aeration controllers do very well, is that they'll actually look at both temperature and relative humidity, and they'll pick the, the best for us. So, you know, for an example, um, if we've got air ambient conditions that uh, might be at 20 degrees, at 20 degrees might be cooler than a grain that's, say, come off the header at 30 degrees. But air at 20 degrees, if it's, say, 80% humidity, won't be as good for cooling as air that's at 20 degrees and say 40 percent humidity. So we're really trying to target cool dry air. That will be our best for cooling. So cool dry air is what we're targeting there as a general rule. Um, I'm happy to provide more information on that for, um, for you if you'd like more detail. It, it really does get, get a little bit involved in trying to pick the right air. Um, the other thing to understand about picking the right air for cooling is that the aeration process really starts as soon as the grain um, covers the aeration ducting in the silo. So as soon as that grain ducting covered, we want the aeration fan on um, constantly, all day, for about the first three to five days. So that doesn't matter whether the, you know, it might be a 40 degree day outside, we still want the aeration running. What we're trying to do is even out the, the temperature and the moisture in the grain. We're just trying to even it out with uniform conditions in there with any harvest, heat and sweating out of the grain. Then over the next uh, roughly five days, we want to try and pick, and this is what a lot of the controllers will do, they'll try and pick the coolest 12 hours of the day. Coolest 12 hours of the day, that's the next part of the cooling process. Um, and after that, we can then start trying to get fussy, um, trying to select the coolest, driest air that we can. So about, the, ideally about 24 hours in a week or 100 hours in a month is, is what we're looking for to pick in those conditions. As I said, the aeration controllers really do an efficient job of that. Are there other questions that people have got around um, storage maintenance or other things going to storage? Well, you're perhaps thinking of some. Um, one that I often get asked about is protectants. Um, and it's something you can add to the maintenance list. Um, having a look at if you're going to use protectants, if they're appropriate for, for your cereal grains and your markets, um, consider how you're going to mix them up, how you're going to calibrate your, 
um, your, your auger flow and, and also your, your application. And here you're going to put even application protection. So they really do rely on, on correct calibration. We can't afford to get the rate wrong. If we underdose, it won't do the job we want it to do. If we overdose, we risk exceeding the maximum revenue limit. So having a, a calibrated system and an even application system is really important. Again, something we can do prior to harvest and get set up to make the job easier and when the pressure, pressure of harvest comes on. Another one I often get asked about is, is ground level applications for phosphine. So those systems where you can put phosphine in at the ground level, that's something that um, your contractors will add to your silo. Again, you know, I keep going on about gas type storage, but it's it's really fundamental. So the first thing we need to understand for phosphine is that we need gas type storage. Doesn't matter whether the phosphine goes in at the top or the bottom, it needs to be gas type. Uh, but those ground level applications, if it, if it is a gas type storage, um, can be a good addition. The key points we need there is that we really need a large um, compartment to be able to put the phosphine in. We don't want it too small and crammed that the phosphine can't liberate freely. Because the phosphine could get to a really high concentration um, in a small confined space. So a large box. We then want some large pipe um, to allow good airflow across that phosphine. So airflow from the bottom to the top, or top to bottom um, of the silo. So two points. Um, in and out of that little phosphine box so that air can actually freely flow through um, across the phosphine as it liberates. Some key points. And that's um, often incorporates with a thermo siphon, so it's blowing up the side of the silo that we see. Um, they're, they're really, um, they, be, they become more important when we've got silos over 100 tonne in capacity those thermosiphons, so don't get too excited about needing thermosiphons um, for silos less than 100 tonne. What we're aiming to do with a, with a thermosiphon or a recirculation system, much prefer to see a, a powered recirculation system, but what we're trying to do there, if we understand it takes, uh, it takes a bit of time for phosphine to, to be able to distribute through the grain when it, when it liberates, and so that, um, that thermosiphon we're trying to do is reduce the amount of time it takes for the phosphine gas to get rich and even concentration right through the grain stack. A couple more questions coming in, fantastic. What is the recommended airflow rate for grain cooling? Great question. So for cooling, we don't need too much airflow. It's actually, we, we say the range of two to four liters of air per second per tonne. That's not that much air. If we're looking at drying, we're looking at much higher airflow rates of 15 upwards liters of air per second per tonne. So cooling, we don't need a whole lot of air. Something to be aware of, if we've got an aeration system that's designed to, to put out four liters of air per second per tonne through something like wheat or barley, if we then go and fill that silo with canola or lentils or something that's um, a higher density grain, our system that's designed to deliver four litres of air per second per tonne through canola may only deliver something like two litres of air per second per tonne. So that's why I've got a range in there. Being aware of um, the back pressure that different grains put on the fan um, becomes important in selecting the fan size. Good question. Another one here. Uh, with this, how do you recommend measuring airflow rates to know what we're achieving? Correct airflow. Great question again. There's actually uh, a little fact sheet on it on the stored grain website, storedgrain.com.au. Um, if you'd like to shoot me an email, info at storedgrain.com.au, I can send you a direct link as well. Um, it's you could make up a, a, a piece of tube basically that goes on the inlet of the fan, um, and, and then get a wind speed monitor meter or an anemometer, and you can actually measure the airflow rates system. A um, little bit of mucking around but, but it's certainly possible to check what airflow rate you are achieving. Um, and I assume it's common sense that we want to check that airflow rate when the silo has grain in it, when it's got the back pressure of grain um, working against that. Um, another question here, aeration drying versus aeration cooling. 
it just as a matter of fan airflow rate. That's that fan airflow rate is certainly the primary difference. Um, if we try and do aeration drying with a small small airflow rate, small fans, we, we really, when you think about the amount of moisture we're trying to remove from the grain, we just can't carry that amount of moisture out of a grain state with, with small airflow. So we need high airflow to do that. And, and it's not just a matter of saying, well, I'll double my airflow from maybe four litres to eight litres and, and hopefully do some drying. What we risk there is, if we do some drying at the bottom of the silo, that we actually carry the moisture from the grain at the bottom of the silo, part way up the silo, but not right out the top. So we actually end up wetting the patch of grain in the silo. Um, so that can be quite dangerous, having airflow between that four and 15 litres. So if we're gonna go drying, we really do need 15 litres and upwards. And then we're obviously selecting a bit different air. It's a, quite a different process for aeration and drying. It's a long, long run times, particularly at the start, um, getting uniform conditions um, in the grain stack itself, and then slowly drying it down over time. Much longer process than cooling. With cooling, we can expect to get you know, the harvest heat off the grain, 10, to 10 degrees, bring it from, from the mid 30s down to mid 20s. That should only take a couple of weeks. Um, or a week, depending on your, your system. Um, so it can cool grain down quite quickly, but aeration drying, depending on the, the ambient conditions that you've got in your area, can be a much longer process. And we really do need, we do need low relative humidity air is what we're trying to fix the So good question. And again, if you'd like more information, um, that's storedgrain.com.au website, or click me an email and I can send you a direct link to some information on, on aeration and, and Cooling and drying and differences there. The other contact, of course, 1 800 Weevil uh, is a phone number you can call to get in contact with your nearest grain storage specialist. Um, so feel free to use that service um, and ask us any questions. The other thing I'll offer just before we wind up if you guys would like more information um, about grain storage in general um, under the JDC project um, we, we can come and hold a workshop in your region and we can go through things in more detail more than happy to do that one more question here just before we finish up does aeration prevent condensation on the inside of the top of the silo great question it certainly does we often see condensation as a result of the silo being locked up it's a common misunderstanding that we buy a sealable silo to actually seal it up to keep the insects out. And that's when we see real condensation issues. So first thing to understand is when we buy a, a gas tight sealable silo, we only want to seal it up when we're fumigating. The rest of the time we want it open, we want it venting, and ideally with aeration cooling. But aeration cooling will keep fresh air going through the grain. We'll carry that, that um, that warm, moist air that would be sitting in the hot space after harvest carries that out of the silo, and, and that's what stops the condensation. So, absolutely, good question. If there's no more final questions, and like I said, feel free to email any more through to me info at storedgrain.com.au. If there are no final questions, I might uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, again, encourage you to, to catch up again on the 8th of October, the next webinar um, on bags and, and, and bunker storage. And thanks again for your time today.